everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the My IBD Learning webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on a very important topic, being mindful about diet and IBD. We are going to hear from our expert faculty on the latest research updates on diet and nutrition and the role that diet plays in the management of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. My name is Arushi Malhotra, and I'm the Senior Manager of Education and Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. I'm pleased to be facilitating tonight's program. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is continuing to provide the latest information on IBD to our patients during the pandemic. The My IBD Learning webinar series features different topics each month. By registering for today's webinar, you have automatically been registered for the series, which takes place on the third Thursday of each month. As a reminder, our next webinar will be taking place on Thursday, September 23rd. We encourage you to explore the webinar website to learn more about our monthly programs and read about our presenters. Please also take a moment to upload a photo to your profile to facilitate networking and connection with other attendees. Under the homepage, you can find different tabs to get to the agenda, join the live webinar, watch recordings of previous webinars, as well as learn more about upcoming webinars. You can connect to a local support group or your local foundation chapter and much more. To learn more about the event platform, go to the navigation Q&A tab. If you have any questions during the program, visit the live discussion and a virtual help desk attendee will assist you. A few housekeeping reminders before we begin. You've all been placed on mute for the webinar. All the presentations will be recorded and accessible to view after the completion of tonight's program. If you do have questions for our faculty, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box at any time throughout the program. I would like to thank our event sponsors, Julia, Jansen, Takeda, and Bristol Myers Squibb for supporting the My IBD Learning webinar series. Their support enables the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and our partners to continue to provide important education for patients and caregivers. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker and my co-facilitator for this evening, Kelly Isaacson. Kelly is a certified nutrition support clinician and has been a registered dietitian for over 11 years at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. She specializes in IBD, providing nutrition counseling to hospitalized patients and joining the IBD team on rounds where she educates GI fellows and residents on the specific nutritional needs of the IBD patients. Kelly also counsels GI patients in her outpatient clinic and at the Nutrition and Integrative IBD Subspecialty Clinic. She's involved in nutrition research at Cedar sinai and within the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. We welcome you, Kelly, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Arushi. I'm very excited to join this evening's presentation and cannot wait to share the wonderful information we have planned for tonight. I would like to introduce you to this evening's expert faculty who will be sharing uh, pertinent information related to diet and IBD. Dr. David Suskind from Seattle Children's Hospital IBD Center uh, in the University of Washington. Dr. James Lewis from the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Lori Kiefer from the ICANN School of Medicine in, at Mount Sinai in New York. Before we hear from the other faculty, I'd like to provide a general overview of diet and nutrition in IBD. So let's get started. Inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic, progressive, relapsing, and remitting disease. It affects 1% or about 3, 3 million people in the United States, and there are two main subtypes. Crohn's disease, where inflammation can um, happen at any part of the GI tract from mouth to anus, and ulcerative colitis, where intestinal inflammation is limited to the colon. IBD's effect on nutrition um, is vast. Uh, it can impair digestion and absorption. It can alter metabolism. It can lead to decreased appetite, um, decreased intake of foods. It can cause weight changes and even nutrition deficiencies. And when we ask patients how they feel about nutrition, about 80% feel nutrition is an important part of their IBD management. 40% believe diet can control symptoms, and 40% have modified their diet without the assistance of a physician or a registered dietitian. And this is really important to, to, to um, pay attention to because food avoidance can increase risk for malnutrition, which if you're flaring can make um, you know, recovery from that 
uh, longer or if you're in the hospital can increase your risk for infections or longer hospital lengths of stay. So before we get into more of the details about diet and nutrition, I just want to talk about the different types of remission because a lot of people come to me already having changed their diet and say they feel great, they're in remission. So what does that mean? Um, the first type of remission is called clinical remission where you're feeling well and you don't have any symptoms. That's great. But studies show and what we know is that um, Clinical remission does not correlate well with what's going on inside. So we need to take a deeper dive and look at your biochemical markers of inflammation, such as uh, fecal um, sedimentation rate, CRP, as well as your stool uh, markers of inflammation like fecal calprotectin. And then it's also important to get your regular checkups like your colonoscopy so that the doctor can take a look inside and make sure that not only are you feeling well, but things are looking good inside, no active inflammation. And we call that endoscopic remission. And the deepest form of remission is called histologic remission. That's where when you get your colonoscopy and the doctor takes that biopsy of the tissue and looks at it under a microscope and sees no inflammation. And that's where we really want you. That's our goal for therapy because research shows that people have better long-term outcomes when they achieve deep remission. So some of the reasons people restrict or avoid foods in their diet is um, because it's a natural response. If you're finding that foods consistently trigger symptoms such as lactose, which is the sugar in dairy products or caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods, fatty foods, these are some of the common triggers that um, patients will um, avoid in their diet. Um, and it makes sense to limit them, especially if, if you notice that they're consistently causing problems. But it's also normalized in the medical community. Um, healthcare professionals will routinely re recommend dietary restrictions to their patients if they have active disease or stricturing disease, which is narrowing of the intestines, um, or if they've just had surgery. Patients are often told to avoid fiber or even other components of the diet. In my clinical practice, these are some of the common food avoidances that I see. Um, people are often avoiding things like red meat, gluten-containing products, dairy, and fruits and vegetables. And the important thing here is to note that these foods are good sources of certain macronutrients, such as calories and proteins and good fats, as well as micronutrients like iron and vitamin B12 and zinc and calcium and vitamin D. So if you find that you're avoiding these foods on a regular basis, it's important to talk to your healthcare provider so that you can find alternates that meet your nutrition needs without triggering your symptoms. And I listed some uh, substitutes you can consider here. So can you eat fiber? I think low fiber diet is probably the number one uh, recommendation that healthcare providers give to their patients when they're asking about diet. Fiber comes from plant foods and it's fermented by microorganisms to produce these wonderful anti-inflammatory molecules called short chain fatty acids. Oats, beans, bran cereals, these are excellent fuel sources for our microorganisms to produce these short chain fatty acids. Again, um, short chain fatty acids are kind of like your colon's primary fuel source and they provide an anti-inflammatory effect. So they're really beneficial for our health. Um, in people with strictures or that narrowing in their intestines, a soft diet or a small particle size diet may be better tolerated. And really what we're concerned with there is large particles like whole nuts or seeds or dried fruits getting stuck in those narrowed areas and causing obstructive symptoms. So instead of avoiding fiber altogether or avoiding fruits and vegetables, which are so important for our health, consider trying things like applesauce instead of apples or hummus or bean puree instead of whole beans or things like vegetable or fruit smoothies or soups instead of whole salads or whole berries. Further, recent research has found improvement in symptoms and decreases in risk for flares over time when people with IBD increase fiber intake. Dr. Lewis is gonna talk more about his findings from the recent Dying CD trial. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on the IOIBD recommendations, which is the International Organization of the Study for IBD. They recently published a, a really comprehensive document on 
dietary recommendations for people with IBD. They looked at the literature of food and food components and how they affect inflammation or symptoms in people with IBD and came up with recommendations of foods to increase or decrease in the diet of people with Crohn's or colitis. And what they recommend is that overall people with IBD should increase their fruit and vegetable intake as well as omega-3 fatty acids because we see that that helps to improve symptoms and reduce risk for flares over time. They did have some recommendations for foods to avoid or really try to limit in your diet. Um, and I think the key here is to avoid um, or limit and not um, uh, avoid altogether. So um, those would be things like saturated and trans fats, bread and processed meats, dairy, dairy fat, palm and coconut oil, and emulsifiers or food additives. Um, again, if you can find alternates to these foods, great. It's okay to have these occasionally, but the researchers really think that uh, including these in a regular diet on a daily basis might contribute to more symptoms and disease activity. If you do find yourself with significant food fears, definitely talk to your team about that. Dr. Kiefer is going to talk more about mental health and, its, and, and diet's impact on, on uh, mental health and, and co some coping strategies. Um, but what I often recommend to my patients is to keep a food and symptom log and to really identify some safe foods. Um, studies show that people um, report yogurt, rice, and bananas to be very comforting and safe foods, especially during a flare. And if you can find these safer foods to lean on during flares instead of avoiding altogether, you'll be able to nourish yourself in um, a gentle way and help yourself recover from that flare a lot quicker. A food and symptom log can help you to identify diet triggers, but please know that these are going to be different for everyone. So if somebody's like, you know, you can, you have IBD, so you can't have bell peppers, that's not true at all. Maybe that person can't tolerate bell peppers but you might be able to just fine. Um, also, your, your response to foods is gonna change over time. If you have active disease versus if you're in remission, you're gonna have a different response to, to certain, uh, sorry, certain foods. And just because you have a symptom from eating a certain food does not mean that damage is being done or that there's inflammation that's um, uh, resulting from eating that food. So when you identify that food, maybe it's bananas, um, you know, does that food consistently trigger your symptoms? Does it help if you eat it in different ways or in smaller portions or with different foods? And don't forget to focus on the basics, um, like eating in peace, eating slowly, chewing your foods well, and stopping when you're full. Really listen to those internal body cues because those can make a huge difference in how you digest your meals and how you feel afterward. I just wanted to touch a little bit on some micronutrients that are commonly low in people with IBD. Um, things like iron, um, there's a high prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in IBD. B12 can be low in people with um, ileitis or inflammation of the last part of their small intestine or maybe a, a, a resection of that area, um, as well as B6. The folate can be low in people on certain medications like methotrexate or sulfasalazine or people avoiding dark leafy green vegetables. And then vitamin D deficiency is so common in IBD and research suggests that it really can affect disease uh, activity and quality of life. So these are some of the nutrients I monitor in my patients. If you haven't had your nutrition labs done recently, maybe ask your provider if that's necessary and if you need to supplement definitely talk to your provider first. Um, and then osteopenia and osteoporosis are common in IBD. We really wanna protect your bone health. If you've had a history of steroid exposure or if you um, have uh, malabsorption or if you're avoiding dairy products, you might need to take extra calcium and vitamin D supplements to protect your bone health. So there's really lots of benefits of working with your team. Your GI doctor can help uh, modify your medications to help control your disease so you can expand your diet out further. A psychologist uh, can give you some coping strategies and advice for uh, relaxation or helping uh, to help you navigate those food fears and, and other mental health aspects of IBD. And a registered dietitian is the nutrition expert who can provide you with evidence-based nutrition therapy for IBD, um, help you to navigate nutrient deficiencies Efficiencies and help you establish uh, that relationship with food that's so important for your well-being.
And last, these are some resources if you're looking for a dietitian. Um, these are great websites to check out with searchable databases. Um, if you've had surgery, the UOAA or the Ostomy Association of America is a great resource, as well as the OLE Foundation if you've been on nutrition support or if you're going to start. And then, of course, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, who recently updated their diet and nutrition information. Okay. And with that, um, unfortunately, um, Dr. Lewis was not able to join us live, um, but he was very kind to record his presentation for us on the research being done around diet and remission, as well as the results from the DIME CD study. So let's take a look at that. Hi, I'm Jim Lewis. I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm the principal investigator of the DINE CD study, which I'm going to tell you about this evening. Before I start, I want to acknowledge my collaborator from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, Angela Dobes, who served as the administrative principal investigator for this study, and my friend and colleague from the University of North Carolina, Dr. Robert Sandler, who was the director of our data management center. I also want to acknowledge our funding support from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, as well as the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, also known as PCORI, and funding from the National Institutes of Health and from a Sherman Award. This was a very unique research opportunity because the DINE CD study in many ways was proposed by patients. We leveraged the IBD Partners online community to see what topics patients found most interesting to them. Uh, in this platform, patients like yourself are able to pose questions that they feel would be important to be addressed and other patients can go in there and endorse those. And some of the questions that really rose to the top had to do with the role of diet in the management of inflammatory bowel disease. Before I tell you about the DINE CD trial, I want to take a minute and just cover a little bit of vocabulary uh, and the way we interpret these trials. So, a clinical trial is any study where there's an intervention that's not part of usual care. So, if you do something to a patient because they're in the research study, that's a clinical trial. A controlled clinical trial means that you're studying two interventions that or more that are able to be compared to each other. Sometimes one of those uh, interventions is placebo, but they could both be active interventions. And a randomized controlled clinical trial means that the allocation of which intervention an individual patient will receive is determined by chance. This is very important because it eliminates the potential that sicker participants will get one intervention, while those who are less sick will get another intervention, or that there's some other characteristic that will influence what intervention patients get, so that at the end of the trial, you're not sure whether the differences you're seeing are due to differences between the interventions or differences in the characteristics of the patients. So by using randomization to determine which intervention a participant will get, we eliminate that effect. And in addition, the larger the trial is, the more randomization makes the two groups or more groups that are studied in the trial look more similar to each other. So that at the end of the trial, any differences in outcomes can be attributed to the effect of the intervention. When we do these trials, we're always gonna do some sort of statistical test to determine how likely it is that we would see findings like we saw in the trial based on chance. And sometimes you'll see that there are comparisons done between groups and other times within groups. You should mostly focus on the between group care comparisons. These are the ones where we're thinking about, was it a causal effect? Did one intervention work better than the other and cause the outcomes that we've seen? Within group tests are interesting, but they're not, but the findings are not necessarily due to the intervention. 
It could just be that you're seeing the natural history of the disease or sometimes just being in a clinical trial, people change their behavior and you'll see differences in outcomes from the time that they enrolled in the trial to the end of the trial. Most statistical tests will be uh, described the results of these tests using what's referred to as a p-value. Um, this tells us, again, um, how likely it is that we would see differences as big as we observed in our experiment by chance. A p-value of less than 0.05 is the traditional definition of statistical significance, meaning that the findings were unlikely, but not impossible, to be due to chance. When the p-value is 0.05 or greater, we say that the outcome was not significantly different between the two groups. However, it's really important to know that that does not mean that the interventions are equally effective. So the dine cd trial compared two diets, and one of these is the specific carbohydrate diet. This diet was first uh, described by uh, Dr. Sidney Haas and Meryl P. Haas, and they used this diet to treat patients with celiac disease, but that was before we understood what the causes of celiac diseases were. Subsequently, this diet was made famous by Elaine Gottschall in her book, Breaking the Vicious Cycle. Dr. Godschalt's theory was that the specific carbohydrate diet was predicated on the understanding that ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and other conditions are the consequence of an overgrowth and imbalance of intestinal bacteria. And that by altering nutritional intake, we could bring the, back the balance in the intestinal bacteria and heal the digestive tracts. Shown in this schematic below, her theory was that there's injury to the lining of the intestines. It leads us to poorly absorb carbohydrates. The bacteria there consume those carbohydrates, grow and ferment them into toxins that cause more mucosal injury and that the cycle would recur. The other diet that we studied in the Dine CD trial is called the Mediterranean diet. And you've probably heard about it because it's been associated with many different health benefits. Within the general population, it's been associated with a lower all-cause mortality, as well as a reduction in the risk of heart disease and cancer. And for patients with Crohn's disease, it's been associated with being less likely to, uh, to be diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and for those patients who already have Crohn's disease, use of this diet has been associated with reduced symptoms and improved quality of life. So just to compare these two diets before I tell you about the results of the study, the specific carbohydrate diet is characterized by a high intake of unprocessed meats, poultry, fish, and eggs, most vegetables, most fruits and nuts, and some legumes, but avoidance of all grains and dairy other than some selected hard cheeses and homemade yogurt that's been fermented for 24 hours. And the only sweetener in general that is used is honey. The Mediterranean diet, on the other hand, is characterized by a high intake of olive oil, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and cereals, a moderate intake of fish and poultry and wine, and limited intake of red and processed meats, and sweets. So they have some things that are in common and others that make them different. The design of the study was uh, a 12-week, what's referred to as a parallel group randomized clinical trial with 194 participants where we compared these two diets. And the main inclusion criteria were that people with Crohn's disease had mild to moderate symptoms and were on stable dose of their medications. Then we excluded people, for example, who were pregnant, who had an ostomy, had known strictures, meaning narrowings in their intestines, or who had been using the specific carbohydrate diet within four weeks prior to screening. This schematic shows you the overall design of the trial. So the trial ran for 12 weeks, but the primary outcome was assessed at six weeks, and that main outcome measure was symptomatic remission. And one of the key features of this trial was that 
for the first six weeks, we provided participants with all of their meals, ready to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks a day. And you can see an example of a specific carbohydrate diet dinner uh, on the left and a refrigerator full of prepared meals ready to be heated and eaten. During the second six weeks of the trial, participants actually had the opportunity to purchase food from our vendor, but most opted to actually obtain their own food, mostly likely cooking their own food. We screened 460 participants potential participants to identify 197 who could be randomized, but three of these people um, actually dropped out before they had the opportunity to start their study diet. And then there were a few others who we had to exclude from the analysis due to a technical error, leaving us uh, 191 participants in the final efficacy analysis. So here are the main results at six weeks. You can see that symptomatic remission was achieved by 43.5% of the participants on the Mediterranean diet and 46.5% of those on the specific carbohydrate diet. Clinical remission measured with a slightly different measure was almost identical to that of symptomatic remission. Um, reduction in bowel inflammation is measured with calprotectin. Uh, was seen in approximately 31% and 35% of the two groups. And CRP, a marker of systemic inflammation, normalized in a, in a very small proportion of the patients, approximately 4% and 5% of the two diets, respectively. And you can see by looking at the p-values that none of these differences were statistically significant. If we look at the within-group comparisons, however, you can see that in both diets, with both diets, patients tended to feel better over the course of the first six weeks of the trial. And that uh, didn't matter whether we were measuring symptomatic remission, uh, as I mentioned with the short CDAI, or if we looked at quality of life with the short IBDQ, or at some other features such as fatigue, pain, sleep, and social isolation. And this was true for both of the diets. However, the amount of improvement on the two diets was not significantly different when you compare between the two diets. And then here are the results at week 12. Remember in the second six weeks, participants were on their own to uh, obtain their food. And you can see that the results were relatively similar and again, none of these reach traditional levels of statistical significance. So in conclusion, both of these diets were well tolerated despite increased consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we note that this is not something that we necessarily routinely have recommended to patients who had active symptoms in the past, but maybe what we've learned from this is it is okay to recommend patients to go ahead and consume more fruits and vegetables. Uh, symptomatic remission was relatively common with both of the diets, but specific carbohydrate diet was not more effective than Mediterranean diet for any of the outcomes. And neither diet was associated with normalization of systemic inflammation as measured by CRP. From that, I think you could say that either of these diets could be tried to improve symptoms. Uh, I will note that the uh, other health benefits that have been observed with the Mediterranean diet may make that the preferred diet for most patients. Albeit, I should also note that the specific carbohydrate diet has never been tested to my knowledge for those other health benefits. So I can't say definitively that it wouldn't have those same other health benefits. I would, however, also note that the Mediterranean diet is a bit less restrictive and so quite a bit easier to follow. And if, if a patient does work with their physician and decide that they're going to use diet as part of their treatment algorithm, I'd also just like to emphasize that it's important to assure that the inflammation is resolved, even if the symptoms have improved. I'd like to just acknowledge the many, many different uh, sites who participated in this 
trial and the local principal investigators who, who made this happen. And most importantly, I would like to thank the patients who partic participated in the Dine CD trial. Uh, you know, without patients being willing to participate in clinical trials, we would never move forward in understanding how best to take care of patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, and I think we owe all of these patients uh, really some gratitude. And I hope that if you ever have the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial, you will uh, definitely consider it. Well, thank you again for uh, joining this symposium, allowing me uh, to tell you about the Dine CD trial, and I hope you enjoy the rest of, of the evening. We're so grateful to Dr. Lewis for sharing his expertise with us and taking the time to record his presentation. I would like to now invite Dr. David Suskind to join us now. Uh, Dr. Suskind is the Director of Clinical Gastroenterology at Seattle Children's Hospital and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Washington uh, School of Medicine. He's an expert in intestinal diseases um, and he's focused much of his energy into clinical care and research for inflammatory bowel disease. He's a leading uh, a national effort to uh, integrate nutritional therapy into clinical care for patients with inflammatory bowel disease and studying the effect of dietary therapy in inflammatory bowel disease. He believes in patient and family empowerment through medical education. Welcome, Dr. Suskind. Uh, thank you so much, Kelly. It's uh, a pleasure to be here um, and to uh, present uh, what we've learned uh, from the research in uh, IBD and diet. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about learning lessons from dietary research in IBD uh, and kind of briefly talk on you know, what to eat. And I think actually the presentation uh, by Kelly was uh, a phenomenal overview uh, in terms of uh, recommendations and for most people, uh, exactly uh, what uh, we do here at Seattle Children's as well. So these are my disclosures. So first of all, why is diet important in IBD? Well, food is necessary for life. We all know that. But the foods we eat also affect how our bodies function. So why is it also important to focus on diet in IBD? Well, first of all, we have to realize that environment and specifically our dietary environment has a big impact in IBD. And if you look at the pictogram on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see this because although our genes are important and we know that, um, our genes are the same genes our ancestors had, but rearranged slightly differently. But our environment has changed and that change in environment has led to an increased incidence in inflammatory uh, bowel disease uh, in the world. Other important reasons why to focus on diet. If you look onto the right-hand side of the screen, this shows you a pictogram of uh, one of the studies done on one of the many good medications that we have out there. But medications, uh, although they are quite effective, don't always work. In addition, sometimes they work, but not completely. And so focusing on other ways of improving uh, individuals' outcomes is important. And finally, uh, if you look at the bottom pictograph, we all realize that IBD is costly. It's not only costly in terms of the medications, uh, which can cost upwards of $30,000 a year, uh, but also in terms of uh, its impact on the individual, in terms of productivity, time lost, uh, dealing with uh, active disease. So all these reasons, are quite important in terms of why we should focus on diet. But to understand how diet works uh, in IBD as well as uh, in life in general, it's important to understand uh, what intestinal health entails. So when we look at our intestines, uh, where we absorb uh, our foods, uh, where IBD uh, occurs, 
uh, we note three important components. One is the microbiome, that 100 trillion bacteria that live within our uh, bowels that we want in there because it protects us, it pr uh, breaks down food for us, it makes vitamins for us, um, but are definitely also implicated in IBD. But in health, the microbiome lives uh, well with uh, our mucosa, the lining of our GI tract, uh, which keeps the vast majority of those bacteria away from our immune system, uh, which is right below the lining of the GI tract. But something happens in IBD. So there is a um, change in the microbiome. Uh, the bacteria become what we call dysbiotic. So they become pro-inflammatory. There's also a breakdown of the lining of the GI tract, which allows the immune system, those cells under the lining, to interact with the bacteria and upregulate and cause worsening inflammation, ulcerations, which lead to the symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, and uh, weight loss. So right now, I think it's important for us to kind of realize that diet has an effect on all these areas. And what I'd like to do is look at each of those areas uh, briefly to kind of concentrate how diet uh, interacts with them. So first, the microbiome, those 100 trillion bacteria in our GI tract. As I had mentioned, uh, in IBD, the microbiome becomes dysbiotic. So the bacteria, again, become more pro-inflammatory. And what that means in real terms is that there's a decrease in the type of bacteria, the biodiversity goes down. There's a decrease in the type of bacteria that we uh, believe help us and help uh, maintain uh, homeostasis within the GI tract. There is an increase in bacteria that um, uh, break down the lining of the GI tract, the mu mucus layer. Uh, and there is also a decrease uh, in the abundance of good bacteria that make butyrate and propionate. And these are molecules that help uh, feed uh, our GI tract. But how is diet interrelated with the microbiome? So when I think of the microbiome, the bacteria that live within our GI tract, I think of animals, uh, although they are not truly animals, but um, I do uh, correlate the two. And if we think of multicellular animals like a tiger or a dolphin or a panda or a gorilla or a cow, and we were to feed all of those animals hay, we wouldn't be surprised that some of those animals would die off and we might uh, end up with a lot of cows. Well, the same thing is true for the microbiome. The microbiome uh, is a diverse group of organisms, and what you feed it will either increase or decrease the bacteria in there because different bacteria like eating different foods. I had also mentioned that diet plays a role in the lining of the GI tract, in the health of the GI tract, um, and can actually, and has been shown, to actually break down that lining of the GI tract. And as um, uh, Kelly had mentioned, uh, there are a number of things that have been recommended to kind of try to avoid in the diet. And a lot of this is based off of basic science uh, studies that have been done uh, in animals. And the list that is included here includes emulsifiers, high fat, high sugar diets, carrageenan, uh, caking agents, and microparticles. And I'll give you one example of the studies that have been done. And this is a study by Martinez Medina uh, and, uh, the, um, and his group uh, that looked at a high fat, high sugar diet and the lining of the GI tract. So a high fat, high sugar diet was noted to do a number of things. 
One, it increased that dysbiosis, those bad bacteria, by increasing uh, E. coli in these animals that are predisposed to developing IBD. Uh, but it also did a number of other interesting things to the lining of the GI tract. If you look at the pictograph uh, on the uh, right-hand side, you can see that there is a decrease in the red, um, the red coloring. And that red coloring um, uh, shows you the mucus layer, that layer that keeps the bacteria away from the immune system. And with a high fat, high sugar diet, that layer is thinned out. So again, those bacteria and the immune system uh, start to interact. It also does a number of other things. And if you look at the pictograph on the uh, left-hand side, you can see that a high-fat, high-sugar diet uh, increases uh, the Claudin-2. And these are pore-forming um, molecules, which literally lead uh, to a leaky, the proverbial leaky gut. So again, food can have an effect, uh, certain foods can have an effect on the lining of the GI tract. Foods can also have a direct effect on inflammation. And there have been a number of foods been shown to uh, be more pro-inflammatory, uh, like wheat germ gluten and amylase trypsin inhibitors. And there have been foods uh, or molecules within full foods that have been shown to be more anti-inflammatory, like isothiocyanates, polyphenols, uh, and others. So that's a lot of interesting information, but what does that mean for the individual patient? Well, I think that having a balanced diet for the vast majority of individuals is extremely important not like this pictograph, not that type of balance, uh, but an overall balanced diet. But diet is very patient specific. And as already mentioned, there are certain situations where we want to uh, avoid certain types of food or, um, or certain um, uh, breakdowns of food. And so strictures or narrowing in the bowels, uh, you don't necessarily want to decrease the overall fiber, but the type of fiber that you take uh, in its structure. Uh, if there are bowel resections, you want to look at making sure that you get a certain number of uh, a certain amount of foods that have um, uh, the micronutrients that might be affected by those types of bowel resections. Food allergies, age, uh, as well as activity level, all are important in ter determining what an individual's diet should be. And my push for that would be for a majority of individuals to actually see a dietitian and talk with a dietitian about what a healthy diet is uh, in inflammatory bowel disease. But there are a number of diets that we have been researching and we know have a positive effect, whether it is on symptoms or symptoms and inflammation, inflammatory burden. And the best research uh, dietary intervention is exclusive enteral nutrition. And in pediatrics, this has been shown to not only decrease uh, symptoms or improve symptoms um, equal to that of steroids, but also decrease inflammation equal to that of steroids as well. Not only does it do that, but it heals the bowels um, better than steroids do. And so in pediatrics, we really try to focus on exclusive enteral nutrition for children with Crohn's. And there have been some uh, adult uh, research showing its effectiveness, but some adult research showing that it is not as effective as steroids. But with regards to whole foods diets, there have been uh, other studies. And uh, as you heard, Dr. Lewis had mentioned uh, the Dine CD study, which showed symptomatic improvement for the uh, SCD as well as Mediterranean diet. Uh, in pediatrics, we uh, recently finished the uh, produce study, which was a study that looked at the specific carbohydrate diet uh, versus a modified SCD. And we too saw clinical improvement. 
Uh, but we also saw uh, improvement in uh, the inflammatory burden as well. There is another study called, another diet called the CDED or Crohn's disease exclusionary diet associated with a partial enteral nutrition that has also been shown to be effective in pediatric uh, Crohn's disease. And these diets have been well studied. And there are other studies, other diets that have been less well studied, but shown to be positive uh, effect in IBD. But the question is, what diet would be best for the majority of individuals with IBD? So if you put all these uh, diets together, they do have commonality. And the commonality that they have uh, can maybe make up our recommendations for uh, diets for, again, the majority of patients with IBD. Uh, that would be to remove highly processed foods, foods with a, a large uh, number of additives, foods high in sugar, high in fat and dairy, and really focus on whole foods, uh, vegetables, fruits. So I wanted to end with uh, a clinical case. And the reason I'm ending with this clinical case is just to really show the power that diet can have for uh, individuals with IBD. And this is a 14-year-old young man who presented with abdominal pain, loose stools, weight loss, and the workup showed that he had Crohn's disease. Family wanted to avoid medications due to potential side effects. Uh, and so he went on to uh, EEN uh, and then transitioned to the SCD uh, and went into clinical and laboratory remission for over five years and had endoscopy and colonoscopy uh, which uh, was visually normal, as well as normal histology. And this doesn't mean that this treatment is right for everybody, but it just shows the power that uh, diet can have for individuals with IBD. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that diet matters uh, and um, thank you for uh, your participation. Thank you, Dr. Suskind. We will hold, we're getting a lot of great questions, but we're gonna hold the questions until the last section of the webinar, but we really appreciate learning um, all these lessons from research around diet and IBD that you've just shared with us. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lori Kiefer. Dr. Kiefer is an academic health psychologist and the director uh, for psychobehavioral research within the Division of Gastroenterology at Mount Sinai in New York. She specializes in the psychosocial care of patients with chronic digestive diseases, specifically inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's or, or UC. We're so excited that she's able to join us today and share with us how diet can affect mental health in IBD patients. Thank you, um, everyone, for, for inviting me and, and to be included in this conversation. I think it's hard to disentangle um, a lot of the medical care and dietary care that we have for our IBD patients from the mental health and emotional impact of this disease. So I'm delighted to be able to participate tonight. So I was going to talk in the short time that I have about three about three things. One is how do food and diet affect mental health? And then also specifically in IBD, how does food related quality of life impact IBD outcomes? And then finally, we'll talk about something that is starting to um, grow in, in prevalence, um, which is avoided restrictive food intake disorder. And as we kind of saw from the previous talks, um, actually, I'll go back here, you know, it's really hard to um, talk about um, the um, GI tract, the microbiome without also talking about the central nervous system because the brain and the gut are so well connected. Now, um, first of all, just in the general population, when we look at diet and mood, um, we know that diet quality is both a risk and protective factor for certainly for depression and possibly for anxiety. Several randomized controlled trials done around the world have really demonstrated that mental health um, 
positively correlates um, with a higher nut, vegetable and legume consumption, and negatively correlates with things like processed foods and sugary products. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising because we find the same thing true in physical health. And as we heard from Dr. Lewis and Dr. Suskind, um, that you know these things also negatively affect IBD. But it's also important to recognize that we're not just treating our um, physical health here. We are treating our mental health by following a healthy diet. Um, another really interesting study showed that specifically that the Mediterranean diet, um, when people followed that, they were actually 30% less likely to go on to develop depression, suggesting sort of a more preventative role of the Mediterranean diet on the diagnosis of a mental health condition. And because IBD is so highly associated with the onset of depression and anxiety, this could be a potentially important area or potentially important reason to follow the Mediterranean diet. Um, and then finally, um, once people, um, if people have a depressive condition or a uh, mental health condition, um, going on a Mediterranean diet for as little as three months when supplemented with fish oil in a randomized control trial also demonstrated significant improvements in mental health scores. So this is a very fluid um, process between mood and food um, that could be very relevant to IBD. Remember, this is just in the general population. But we also know that IBD patients have a very complicated relationship um, with food. And um, something that we've recently been looking at is something called intuitive eating, really helping patients identify, as, as we heard from, um, from Kelly, you know, one, piece, one food may bother one patient and another food may bother another patient. And it's important that we don't get too hung up on following strictly one particular diet. And as we've heard, um, it's really important to have a well rounded diet more than anything else. And so this was a study that was a qualitative study where we interviewed patients and asked them sort of what their thoughts were about following a diet. And as you can see here, I won't go into all of the details, but you can see that um, patients are very conflicted about following a strict diet, saying things like they love food, um, but they also have a feeling that the food may have caused their ulcerative colitis. They may say that following a diet might help them, but they're miserable when they follow it and they're not living life at all. Oh. Other patients have looked at food as sort of a way of visualizing what might be happening to their bodies um, and even describing things like flashbacks of a Crohn's flare when they eat certain foods. Again, the brain and the gut are so strongly connected that it makes a lot of sense why their IBD patients go on to develop this very complicated relationship with foods. This brings me to the next point, which is that there is something called food-related quality of life. And this actually cuts across not just um, inflammatory bowel diseases, but all of the digestive disorders in which diet is a intervention. Food-related quality of life basically means the impact that diet, eating behaviors, and food-related anxiety have on a person's day-to-day -day quality of life and on their disease um, management skills. And there have been several studies that have been done both in the US and in the UK, um, really looking at the role that food-related quality of life has on patients with digestive disorders. So what are some of those um, concerns that affect quality of life? And here over to, first I'll start on the right side of the slide where you can look and see that patients with IBD compared to patients that are um, otherwise healthy or patients who have asthma, do have significantly impaired food-related quality of life. And when you drill down to the items that go into these particular scales, you'll see the um, com uh, comments from patients or endorsement of patients of some of the following concerns. One is regret after eating or drinking certain things, sort of that concept of paying the price after a certain food, having to leave the table during a meal to either have a bowel movement or to um, manage nausea or vomiting even. Um, patients will say that they might um, hesitantly um, eat their favorite foods, but don't feel the uh, full experience of the pleasure that that previously might have enjoyed. They may not know if something will trigger them and um, in certain situations may be afraid to try, um, try a food. 
having to fit eating habits into a patient's day can be another impact on quality of life and feeling frustration around not knowing what will make somebody feel sick or not sick. And sometimes it's very very unpredictable. Sometimes my patients will say that even a sip of water can make them feel sick, where others, you know, will find that it really takes a lot to have to move the needle on, on their GI tract. And then food is such a com huge part of quality of life when it comes to social and culture pra cultural practices. And it becomes a real sticking point a lot of times when our IBD patients are unable to engage in certain um, practices with their families and friends. And then, of course, the concept of reducing reduced autonomy, autonomy, the feeling that you don't have control over your day-to-day -day life and that you are somehow the concept of being restricted. All of these things really trigger um, concerns that patients might have um, around diet and IBD. And the important part about this is that the lower the quality of life a person has related to their food related issues in IBD, the more likely they are to go on to develop depression and anxiety. And remember I said before that not only are depression and anxiety tied to poor diet quality, in this case in IBD more specifically, um, low food related quality of life, food restriction, food avoidance um, and food concerns actually increases one's risk of developing depression and anxiety in the setting of their inflammatory bowel disease. So again, we need to make sure that we're really addressing the dietary concerns of our patients because they have, they cannot be disentangled from mental health. And that brings me to sort of the final major point here, which is that, you know, it's very natural for patients with GI symptoms to follow a dietary intervention, either something that they follow based on their physician or their dietitian um, or, or a family member's recommendation. And there are many dietary interventions that are out there and many patients will purposely restrict foods that they think um, may help um, may help them feel better as a way to control their conditions. Um, but many times this is done without the support of a dietitian and may lead to somewhat extreme restrictions or what we kind of think of as a maladaptive response where they may restrict extremely or they may restrict for a prolonged period of time, sort of, you know, patients talk about cutting out foods forever. Um, and because of their lack of professional guidance and the lack of follow-up, this can actually increase one's risk for the development of an eating disorder. And the problem with eating disorders in the context of IBD is that eating disorders can further lead to malnutrition, which is already, um, IBD patients are already at risk for, but it can also impact cognition, making it harder and harder for patients to be flexible around reintroducing foods. Um, and further, as patients continue to have um, more eating disordered behaviors and um, uh, loss of weight, it can actually impact negatively things like their um, motility or their ability to um, move um, food and waste th through their bodies. So this can become a vicious cycle um, in a subset of patients that we do also need to be monitoring for when we, particularly when we are um, recommending a um, dietary intervention. And just to review, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is a relatively new disorder in the diagnostic and statistic manual of psychiatric disorders. It is different from things like anorexia nervosa where patients may be afraid of becoming um, fat or having body image disturbance. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is much more common in GI disorders as a whole, um, which makes sense. Um, but we really should be starting to think about um, being concerned when we see a couple of the hot hallmark symptoms, one being disgust or sensory sensitivity around food. So these are patients who may have, um, are really put off by food, thinking that it doesn't look right, or it doesn't um, smell right, or the texture is not something that they're willing to, to tolerate. It's also um, characterized by an intense fear of aversive consequences. So if I eat this, I may develop bloating, I may develop abdominal pain, I may feel full, I may need to run to the bathroom. And so this over concern that eating a specific food may lead to aversive 
consequences um, may also be a sign of this ARFID um, condition. And then finally, um, the other hallmark symptom of ARFID, um, which again, overlaps a lot with IBD. And so it, we really do need to kind of think through what might be more of a, um, a normal dietary recommendation for our condition versus um, something that is more pathological the lack of interest in food. So this would be the symptom of forgetting to eat, not having enough of an appetite, finding it difficult to make time to eat. Again, leading to malnourishment, leading to significant weight loss, leading to laboratory results suggesting nutrition deficiencies, leading to dependence on enteral nutrition and not being able to reintroduce new foods and significant psychosocial impairment. All of those together um, would really indicate that there might be something more um, serious going on that may need to be addressed, addressed outside of the IBD dietary um, pathway. And then, um, you know, finally, um, I, I can't stress enough the importance of integrated care in the management of, of inflammatory bowel disease. 75% of patients say that they avoid foods in IBD, 20% avoid eating out entirely. And to me, that's really a sign that they need not just their medical care and their uh, management of their um, IBD disease, but that they really need this full approach between a GI dietitian and a GI psychologist and the physician provider to make sure that patients are living that full um, life with their, um, with their chronic condition. And so um, I just wanted to put up a few, um, one slide just sort of saying that if you don't have a integrated care team, you don't have a Kelly or um, a GI psychologist on your team, there are places to look for that, that you could be able to potentially engage um, uh, in, in the community. Again, you may not find a, a GI dietitian specifically, but you may find somebody who's trained um, in the evidence-based um, diets that are out there for um, GI conditions. Same thing for, for gastro psych. You may not find somebody who specializes in GI conditions, but you may find somebody who specializes in chronic illness or in multidisciplinary care. And then finally, I also wanted to point out that if you suspect you or your child or your relative with IBD has an eating disorder, it is really important to assess and treat that upfront because it can have significant impacts on your IBD as well as your, your mental health. So just to take home a few points here, um, clearly the relationship between food and mental health is bi-directional. We cannot disentangle those two things. Food is good for our mental health, but food can also become a problem for our mental health. And we need to be careful in talking to our patients about the pros and cons of dietary intervention. Um, I can't stress enough the role that intuitive eating is important in IBD, um, letting people sort of work with their dietitian and their physician to decide what works best for their customized plan. Certainly we have growing evidence of certain types of diets being more helpful in IBD than others. And the role that um, nutrition plays in management of IBD symptoms, but it is really important to listen to the patient perspective and um, identify um, uh, preferences and um, aversions with the dietitian so that patients can really feel confident in their ability to, to eat healthy and maintain adequate nutrition with their IBD. And then patients with IBD are at increased risk because of the nature of their symptoms and their disease for the development of eating an eating disorder, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And so they really should be assessed and we really should be trying to intervene as early as possible. And again, integrated care is really important. So whenever possible, um, it is really a great idea for um, if a physician or a patient is interested in a dietary intervention that this is offered in the setting of integrated care in consultation with both a dietitian and a mental health provider. And I'll stop there.
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kiefer. That was a wonderful presentation. Mental health uh, related to diet and IBD is something that we don't talk about, and clearly it's something that impacts all of our patients. I hope our patients are able to take this information back to their providers and have an informed conversation. Um, now I'd like to invite all of our experts to turn on their cameras. Um, so we can see your lovely faces and um, let's take some questions from the audience. As a reminder, please submit your questions through the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And I'm just looking through some here. Um, the first one I'm going to ask Dr. Suskind. Um, you talked um, some about the um, research supporting uh, diet therapies and IBD, particularly exclusive enteral nutrition and how effective that can be for our patients with Crohn's disease. Um, can you share um, if there is any information on exclusive enteral nutrition and how it helps patients with ulcerative colitis or if it does or doesn't? Uh, no, it's a great question. Uh, there are actually few studies in ulcerative colitis. Um, in ulcerative place, it doesn't appear to have an effect on disease activity um, and, uh, and doesn't seem to uh, bring patients into remission. Uh, there was a more recent study showing uh, that in ulcerative colitis, for those patients who were in house or in the hospital, uh, that uh, it did improve uh, their nutritional status um, but did not necessarily have an impact on disease. Okay, good, good to know. Um, Dr. Kiefer, um, thank you for sharing the resources for finding a GI-focused uh, psychologist. Um, I think our patients will find that really helpful. Um, you talked a little bit about um, maladaptive behaviors and food avoidances and um, aversions in people with IBD. Um, when, when would it be considered uh, normal to kind of avoid foods and, and when should patients be concerned? Because I mentioned that, you know, food avoidance is part, it's like a natural response. And, you know, if something is giving you symptoms, it, it makes sense to not want to eat that. Um, so, so when should patients be concerned when they're modifying their diet? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I think we're still really trying to figure that out as a GI psychology community. Um, we are seeing a growing prevalence of these eating disorders, and we're trying to understand sort of at what point should we be intervening. And, and I do think this is on a spectrum because, uh, you know, one of the hard parts is that, of course, you're avoiding foods when they cause you symptoms. And there are absolutely foods that cause GI symptoms um, or increase motility. So, you know, you know, I think it's a no brainer that our patients are sort of avoiding or trying to control their diet. But I think where you start to hit that level of, of concern is when you start to see consequences, failure to maintain weight, failure to grow, um, interference with lab values, you know, um, inability to advance the diet once disease is in, a, um, is in sort of, you know, um, uh, endoscopic remission or histologic remission, as you're saying. Um, and then also sort of that psychosocial impairment that comes with um, food restriction. You know, parents will often say, you know, my kid refuses to eat at school. My kid won't eat dinner with us. My, you know, kid will only eat after smoking cannabis. Um, you know, those are all sort of red flags that there's something, um, a that the relationship with food is perhaps becoming more complex than just the normal sort of avoidance of foods that don't make you feel good. And, and I think it is important to monitor those closely. Um, let's see, this next question is for Dr. Suskind. Dr. Suskind, can you talk a little bit about the effect of antibiotics on the microbiome and does that affect uh, short chain fatty acid production at all? Should patients be concerned if they're on multiple courses and uh, of antibiotics? Yeah, so, so like everything in this world, there's 
pros and cons to, to antibiotics. And antibiotics um, have been associated with the development of inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, in pediatrics and in adults, uh, use of antibiotics are associated uh, with the development. With that being said, antibiotics also um, uh, treat infections that uh, can be life-threatening and uh, and you know keep us healthy as well. So um, we need to use antibiotics, but we need to use antibiotics um, appropriately and thoughtfully. Um, in terms of antibiotic use in IBD, uh, antibiotics. Some have uh, shown effect or a positive effect in terms of uh, certain um, uh, situations with active disease, or uh, if you had ulcerative colitis and had a colectomy and uh, may have pouchitis. So it can treat uh, certain uh, types of inflammation uh, with active IBD. Uh, it does have a very negative impact on the microbiome. Uh, it, uh, antibiotics um, are not selective for the most part uh, and uh, take away a lot of uh, good bacteria in the GI tract and therefore affect uh, um, the microbiome and therefore uh, and its interaction with the GI tract. With that being said, if you need them, you need them and you should take them. Um, and that's a discussion with your, uh, your physician um, and why he or she is prescribing them. But, uh, but yes, it does affect the microbiome uh, for the most part in a negative way. Microbiome can actually uh, recover from it, but it does take a while. Ah, thank you for that. And um, uh, yeah, the AGA recently published a paper on probiotic use and, and the recommendations um, found that they can be helpful for pouchitis. So um, Dr. Kiefer, can you comment at all on like probiotic use and, and uh, what you know, if it affects mental health at all, if patients should be supplementing with probiotics or prebiotics to help that aspect of their care? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the data um, in mental health is probably equally riddled, um, as riddled as it is in um, GI health. Um, you know, there certainly is some data um, suggesting that probiotics can be helpful in the anxiety disorder space, um, particularly um, with respect to obsessive compulsive behaviors or um, generalized anxiety and worry. And so certainly my patients who present who sort of have that sort of overlapping um, obsessive compulsive or worry behavior um, asking me about probiotics, I might be more inclined to suggest their, their benefit. Um, but again, not super well supported, um, just like it is in IBD or IBS, where we really kind of say, you know, evidence is pretty weak. The rigor of the trials is not there. Um, but, you know, it's probably not harmful enough to justify a recommendation against if the patient feels that it's helpful. And Kelly, I apologize. Did you say probiotics or antibiotics? Uh, probiotics. Yeah, because you mentioned the <laughs> probiotic use in patients with uh, oh, hepatitis. Okay. okay, but but were they was the question on antibiotics or probiotics? Yes, the question was on antibiotics. Okay, my apologies. And how apologies. that affects the microbiome. My apologies. Okay. <laughs> no, but you answered it beautifully. You just threw in that extra nugget, and I wanted to get uh, Dr. Kiefer's um, uh, opinion on probiotic use for mental health as well. Okay. So that was a nice um, carryover question. Okay. Um, and then let's see, we have time for one more question. Um, Dr. Suskind, can you address this? So somebody's asking, can a person be weaned off of biologic therapy with a strict diet? It's a great question. Uh, and it's a very hard question to answer. We haven't done that study as of yet. Uh, there's a study actually being done, I believe at CHOP at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, where they're actually looking at um, individuals who've been on biologics, who've uh, hit histologic remission, and then placing them on dietary therapy uh, thereafter. Uh, but we don't have the results of that study. And I think what we do need to do, all of us, is really to continue to push forward with uh, dietary research uh, to better answer these types of questions. I think 
one of the things that I think is most important, I think highlighted um, by everybody here is that when we look at diet uh, in IBD, it's really a question of working with your team, uh, with your dietitian, uh, with your psychologist, with your physician to really make sure what's gonna be right for that individual, for, for you. Uh, and, and everybody is unique and everybody's perspective uh, is unique and disease is unique. And so really getting uh, individualized care um, and working with your team is gonna be uh, important. Yeah, I think that's a, I 100% agree with that. And I see our patients do best when we approach their care in a multidisciplinary way, not just focusing on one aspect of health, but all the aspects that can really bring their quality of life up and help to get them in that deeper mission that we want. So mental health, medications, diet, um, all super important for helping our patients Um you know, get better and do better. Um, so thank you again to all of our speakers and to the audience for joining us this for this evening's program. Before we say goodnight, we'd like you we'd like to invite you to view your local chapters upcoming events on either the foundation website or their social media page. We again want to thank our sponsors, um, Gilead, Jansen, Takeda and Bristol Myers Squibb for their support. We hope to see you at an upcoming event. We truly hope you're all doing well and are staying safe and healthy. And we hope to see you at our next webinar on September 23rd on what patients should know about biosimilars. Thank you and have a great evening.